Okay guys, welcome to the lesson on the cardiovascular system. Um, we're going to look at a few um, adaptations, chronic adaptations to exercise. So these are changes that occur um, over a longer period of time due to a longer period of exercise. We're going to look at the following things. Cardiac hypertrophy, increase in resting and exercising stroke volume, decrease in resting heart rate, capillarization of skeletal muscle and the alveoli, reduction in resting blood pressure, decreased heart rate recovery time, and an increase in blood volume. So let's start off with cardiac hypertrophy then. So as we know, hypertrophy uh, is an increase in the size of the muscle. Uh, specifically, we're gonna say it's increase in the size of the sarcomere, uh, which is one of the subunits of the muscle fiber um, where you have the actin and the myosin filaments that slide past one another that we've looked at previously. So the heart muscle itself um, undergoes hypertrophy. Uh, when we exercise, when we stress, the muscle, it responds by uh, growing stronger, growing larger, and so specifically the left ventricle of the heart thickens because it is a muscle, and so therefore when it contracts, it contracts more forcefully, um, and it recruits more muscle fibres when it's stimulated, so it contracts more forcefully, and in doing so, that means more blood can be ejected because a greater pressure can be created, more blood therefore ejected out of the heart with a single beat. The next chronic adaptation, so long-term change um, as a result of exercise, next one for the cardiovascular system is that we increase the resting and the exercising stroke volume. So you'll remember that the stroke volume is the amount of blood that is pumped from the left ventricle of the heart in a single contraction. So it's on its way to the body, to the working tissues, to the muscles. And it's directly related, of course, the stroke volume is related to this, the contractile force, that's the strength of contraction of the cardiac muscle, which we've just talked about. Now, if you're not trained, your stroke volume, that is the amount of volume ejected from the heart with a single contraction, if you're not trained, your stroke volume, whether we're talking at rest or we're talking during exercise, your stroke volume will be lower, it will be less than somebody who is trained. And the table shows you some um, average um, average volumes for stroke volume for the untrained at rest and during exercise and the trained at rest and during exercise. And you'll notice there's a significant difference, a significant benefit in terms of stroke volume from being trained. Resting heart rate is something that we often measure. And of course we measure it in beats per minute. But we see that with the cardiovascular system um, and adaptations to the cardiovascular system as a result of exercise, we often see or we can see a reduction or a decrease in the resting heart rate. And that's simply because the heart itself um, is stronger, as we've just said, and the stroke volume is increased. There can be a reduction in the resting heart rate without having a reduction in the total amount of blood that's being ejected from the heart in a minute. So that's what we call cardiac output, or Q. So at rest, your cardiac output can remain the same um, because your stroke volume goes up, so therefore your resting heart rate can come down without affecting the total amount of blood that is being um, moved around the body, around the system, in a minute. So where a stroke volume goes up, heart rate therefore, resting heart rate therefore can come down. And we'll see that the, the resting heart rate of people who, who do lots of exercise and exercise uh, consistently, um, particularly cardiovascular exercise, their resting heart rate is lower than those who don't do exercise, those people who are more sedentary. Another adaptation, a benefit or advantage of exercise to the cardiovascular system is the capillarization of skeletal muscle and the alveoli. And capillarization simply means an increase in the numbers of capillaries in a given area. So an increase in capillary density. And this happens in two places. It happens both in the muscle and it also happens in the alveoli. Now this capillarization is a benefit because um, the amount of oxygen that can be supplied is related to um, the amount of blood that can be brought to the muscle. Um, and if we have an increased number of capillaries, that means we can have more blood flowing to the muscle. 
So the benefit essentially of bringing more oxygen to the muscle um, means that we can improve our metabolism um, of glucose uh, and also fats uh, in the muscle. And the main benefits or the main adaptations or the most adaptations will occur somewhere between 70 and 80% of your VO2 max, um, which we've talked about previously. Um, you also do get some response um, to high intensity training, but it's debated as to how effective that is in comparison to um, the benefits that you get from cardiovascular, endurance, long distance, um, aerobic um, training. There's also capillarization of the alveoli. So we've talked previously again about the alveoli and their, and their role and what they do physiologically. But essentially, the capillaries that surround the alveoli become more numerous. There's more of them. Um, and so therefore, the gaseous exchange, so the carbon dioxide out and the oxygen in, which happens between the capillary and the alveoli, uh, can happen much more rapidly uh, and much more efficiently. So that's an, yet another benefit of the capillarization of skeletal muscle and alveoli. A further benefit of, uh, of training um, to the cardiovascular system um, is the reduction in resting blood pressure. So blood pressure or hypertension is linked to all sorts of other kinds of diseases um, and it's one of the things that we would look for um, to determine the health of an individual and you've, you've done that yourselves uh, tested blood pressure and you can get an indication of the level of health uh, of that person's cardiovascular system from their blood pressure. Well exercise helps us to reduce that blood pressure um, and particularly aerobic training. So even within the first few weeks of aerobic training uh, we see a reduction in the blood pressure levels at rest. That's probably we think due to long-term relaxation of the blood vessels. Um, so they become more relaxed, uh, which allows then the, the, the flow of blood to be more smooth and then the pressure on the walls of those vessels to be reduced. There is also some benefit from uh, progressive resistance training for uh, bringing blood pressure down, um, but it's less effective than uh, aerobic training, or at least that's what the, the science seems to suggest at the moment. So we might find a decrease of approximately 2% in the systolic pressure and approximately 4% in the diastolic blood pressure with resistance training. Next we've got a decrease in what we call heart rate recovery time and heart rate recovery time is simply a measure of how long it takes after exercise for your heart rate to return to its resting rate. So we would expect a fit person whose heart rate starts off lower, it would rise um, as they did exercise, but then the amount of time that it takes for the heart rate then to return back to resting will be less in a trained or fit, cardiovascularly fit person. It will take less time for their heart rate to return to normal. The longer it takes your heart rate to return to normal, to recover, the longer that takes, the more indication there is that you are either unfit or even potentially unwell. So there are indications that a, d a very delayed heart rate recovery time may have suggestions of or may suggest um, heart disease of some kind. With exercise we can reduce that recovery time um, and it, it's a lot shorter period of time between maximum heart rate or whatever the, the upper end um, that the heart rate gets to and it recovering back to resting. It's a lot shorter for a fit person or somebody whose cardiovascular system is well trained and well used. The next thing then is an increase in blood volume. So blood volume is simply a measure of the total amount of blood circulating in the system. Um, and two things happen um, as a result of exercise, long term chronic changes um, as a result of exercise. First of all, the blood plasma, um, the volume of blood plasma increases um, and that is because the kidneys um, retain more water and so there is basically more water in the blood so that it gives it adds to the overall volume so exercise promotes that water retention by the kidneys so then after two or three weeks we see a, a, an increase as well in the total volume of the blood plasma which makes up the blood right, partly 
the other thing that uh, that happens as well to increase the blood volume is that the numbers of red blood cells also potentially increase. So the hormone EPO, erythropoietin, uh, which you may have heard of in relation to uh, to doping in sport because it can be um, it can be in, uh, injected uh, to have this effect, but it's also naturally occurring. So this hormone EPO stimulates production of red blood cells in the bone marrow um, and then those red blood cells are released into the bloodstream so we have this increase in red blood cells alongside an increase in blood plasma and both of those th two things together will show an overall increase in blood volume. So that's it for this time and um, we've looked at cardiac hypertrophy, increasing resting and exercising stroke volume, decreasing resting heart rate, capillarization of skeletal muscle and alveoli, uh, reduction in resting blood pressure, decreased heart rate recovery time, and increase in blood volume. Thanks for watching.